pleasure to be able to be here, and uh, I've met uh, Terry over the phone before, but this is my first time actually meeting Terry, but I could tell in the spirit that we were one in the spirit long before we actually met, and we had also uh, felt a oneness in terms of the call of God and the purpose of God, and I would like to just re-echo what he had to say that I believe this meeting is one that there's going to be some very significant networking that's going to come out of this. Uh, I've already had a chance to know several of you who actually was down in Austin with Daniel Geraci. He says Geraci, but it's really Geraci, you know, and, and uh, Fulton Sheen, and really appreciate these relationships that God has given to us because we are going to have to come together in what I would call covenant communities. Uh, we need to have covenant relationships. We need to um, uh, be able to know who it is that we're dealing with. Um, uh, I, w w one of the verses in the Bible says something about, I know no one, no man except through the Spirit. There are things that we're going to know each other from a spiritual standpoint. We're going to know who we can trust and who we can't trust and who's being led by the Spirit and who's not being by the Spirit. It's going to become even more important. That's one of the means of communication that we have that uh, nobody can provide for you. It's only God himself that can provide that uh, leading of the spirit to know how we should go. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself in a moment, but uh, uh, I've been a medical missionary for 26 years. I've been in 105 nations, and uh, my whole thrust had been international. Um, but about two, three years ago, the Lord laid on my heart to begin to uh, prepare the body of believers in the United States for the days that we were going to be facing. And uh, boy, I tell you what days we are facing. I tell you, more people are getting uh, awakened by the terrible things that they're seeing on the horizon. And uh, uh, so that's a real, it's a real challenge for us. And the name that the uh, book that God uh, spoke to my heart to write on, on disaster preparedness, was When All Plans Fail. And I remember when I tried to go to various people to publish this and to talk about it, nobody wanted to take the title when all plans fail. Nobody likes to hear negative news is what I was told. They, you got to have something positive, something that's going to give them hope. Well, in the, if you can look at the front of the book actually, and also there's a workbook that accompanies it as well, there's the word hope, very faint in the background uh, that's uh, on, the, uh, on the front cover. But uh, I didn't know this. Now, you know, I've actually had people that have told me that uh, they'll, if, if I pay them a certain amount of money, they'll help uh, me get the, the book uh, number one on the Google search and that type of thing. Well, as it turns out, you can try this yourself. When I typed in, when all plans fail, nobody else in the world has ever written a topic on when all plans fail. Everybody says when all else fails or when nothing else works, and they always have a little bit of a caveat, try to open up the doors for something positive. But I believe all of man's plans are going to fail. And I'm really very appreciative of what Terry's doing in here um, with uh, Prepare the Way because I believe he's right on. And there's many other people, uh, many of you are sitting right here in this audience as well, that you've had an unction inside of yourselves that this is the time we've got to be prepared. This is not the time to think about preparing. This is a time for action. But it's action that's being led by the Spirit of God. And through the different... Uh, uh, by the way, so that because nobody else has when all plans fail, guess what comes up first on the... Google search when you type in when all plans fail. It's this book. And so God knew that. I didn't know that at the time. I just knew that was the title I felt I should call this book. But God's plans never fail. That's the wonderful thing about it. Man's plans fail. But God's plans never fail. And the thing is, he's also given us some warnings ahead of time that these type of things were going to occur. So this has not caught God by surprise. It hasn't caught us by surprise. That this is something that we've anticipated for years. But when you're in the middle of it, I share with Terry, there's a little bit of sense of foreboding. And if we didn't have that faith in God to carry us through, we would all be uh, much more concerned. But we want to have our families ready. We want to have our friends ready. We want to have our neighbors ready, our communities ready, and come into a new relationship. Um, I uh, have been involved with some of the more major uh, natural disasters around the world. In fact, uh, one of the biggest ones... Uh, initially that I was involved with was over in Bangladesh. Uh, in fact, of the 10 worst natural disasters in the last 100 years, about seven of them had occurred in Bangladesh. Uh, this, this one time, this is back in the early 1990s, uh, in one night 150,000 people died uh, when they had a, 
uh, tidal wave uh, that went across uh, an island of Ketubian, went in, inland, 150,000 people died. And uh, we took a medical team over there, and I worked on the island of Ketubdia, where 120,000 people had lived. 40,000 people died in one night. We were the first relief effort, and it was two weeks to three weeks after the event. We were the first relief effort. Now, we're so used to getting upset with our government if somebody doesn't respond in a, a matter of hours uh, after a major disaster. We, we say, who's responsible? How come nobody has showed up? I, I need help. And this is one of the things that I believe uh, this conference uh, is uh, also trying to get people ready for, and that is you need to be individually ready to be able to take care of yourself for a period of time because if we have a major na uh, natural disaster such as what has happened over in Japan, um, everybody is not going to be able to be rescued by somebody from the outside. You've got to be able to take care of yourself if you are surviving the event itself. And so everybody needs to have individual preparedness and later on we're going to talk about having grab-and-go bags at home, in your car, and at work. Now, there's, you don't know where you're going to be when disaster strikes, and depending on what the kind of disaster is, you need to be ready individually. And I appreciated what uh, one of the slides that Terry had, and that is, uh, uh, don't be a victim, be prepared. And uh, that's uh, a motto that I've actually picked up, is be prepared, don't be a victim. Uh, and uh, I stop and think about Joseph being uh, told by God how to prepare, and this Joseph storehouse. And I'm really thrilled to hear what you're saying there, uh, Terry, that um, uh, the time for preparation is now, the st getting the storehouse ready, but now it's time to fill those uh, storehouses. What that says to me is we've got a little window of time to get ready. It's not a large window. And so therefore we need to start now. We need, uh, if, uh, if we haven't already started, many of us have started, but it, it's something, the time is right now. One of the other major uh, disasters that I was involved with, remember when the Hutus and the Tutsis were fighting uh, over uh, in uh, Rwanda? And uh, this was back in 1994. And it's hard for us to imagine these figures, but between a half million and a million people were killed over in Rwanda. And I took a team over into uh, Goma Zaire, now Congo, where there were a million refugees, worked out of a camp, uh, 450,000 people in, uh, in that camp and the camp of Katali. And uh, it was of interest to me that uh, under a secular leadership with the UNHCR um, that, uh, and the French uh, and the Belgium folks were primarily over that international effort, that as Christians and as believers, we were not just terribly op uh, welcomed with open arms. They really kind of resisted us to some degree. The fact that we had 66,000 pounds of medications and supplies and uh, and a medical team, they allowed us to uh, work alongside with the Doctors Without Borders. But the day we arrived, there were 10,000 bodies on the ground. And uh, we drove for like two and a half hours going up to the site where we were going to work. And no matter where we went and looked, there were bodies on the ground everywhere, stacked on one another, maybe one or two here, two, 10 or 15 here, some places 50 or 100 bodies stacked on each other. And we just went along, and you just can't imagine the amount of misery that was there. And, and just, you know, we would just have tears coming down our eyes as we would see such incredible human uh, misery. Children would be sitting beside their dead parents, or parents would be sitting beside their uh, dead children. And people would be dragging themselves to the side of the road, knowing they were going to die, and they wanted to make it easier for the people to pick them up, to take their bodies over to the place to be buried. I have never seen such a, uh, the imagination of such terrible tragedy. And I, the Lord had prepared me ahead of time and given me that scripture, um, uh, a Psalm 91. He says, though a thousand fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, no plague will come nigh your dwelling. That's the hope for the believer. No plague is going to come nigh your dwelling. But I was actually walking uh, and driving through a, a place where I literally saw 10,000 bodies over a period of several hours on the ground. And... Uh, that had died. I'd never thought of that literally being ever fulfilled. I always thought it was kind of figuratively uh, going to be fulfilled, but it, I actually saw it literally fulfilled. But during those weeks that we worked there, we ultimately had a six months presence there. Uh, and our team members did not get sick. God took care of our team. We were walking among dysentery and, um, and cholera and uh, meningitis. And uh, I remember one time I was getting an IV started on a little child and the child pulled his arm back and the needle went into me rather then into him, and I remember just holding my hand and just praying God's protection over me. Um, 
we don't need to fear when we're doing what God is asking us to do. But at the same time, we may be seeing some very, very difficult things. And I'll tell you one of the things that's a difference between those that believe and those that do not. Many of the people that did not believe were actually over there working very hard, and I, I commend them for having gone, but they themselves were not touching the patients. Uh, they were training the national uh, workers to actually handle the patients and start the IVs, but they themselves as medical people were standing back giving advice, but they weren't willing to touch the patients afraid of AIDS and dysentery and cholera meningitis and all these other problems. And, uh, but our team went right in there and we laid hands on people. We, we couldn't speak their language, whether it was in Gala or we, we didn't speak French either. And so we couldn't uh, always communicate except for the love of God flowing through us to them. And um, uh, after we had uh, been there for several weeks, uh, the re refugees uh, erected a tent as a church and they named the church, God Walks in This Place. Now, can you imagine the middle of that terrible devastation that they felt that God's presence was there and God was able to help them through the middle of that? Well, another major disaster I got involved with was that uh, tsunami effort uh, over in uh, Indonesia. If you remember Banda Aceh, where the center of the earthquake actually occurred, that particular earthquake was eight something on the Richter scale and actually impacted many different nations. I think 20 some odd nations had major problems, but the biggest problems were out of Indonesia. And we went into uh, Indonesia uh, with a medical team of 20 some odd people. We had another 20 some Indonesians join with us. And it was of interest to me that uh, the Banda Aceh area is known as the Porch of Islam. And the Christians that worked with us uh, had never been to that area of their own country because it was under Sharia law and uh, they were forbidden and it was uh, fearful for them to go there. Their own lives would be at risk. But because of the disaster, we were able to go in there as medical personnel and to provide care for them. And um, this is something to which, you know, God opened up the door. I say God showed up on the porch and he just uh, uh, came right on in and we were able to establish a permanent work over there in Indonesia through the Indonesians uh, in that area that otherwise the Christians would not have been invited to come. So there are sometimes God is going to use these opportunities of disasters to also be an opportunity to show his love in the middle of that chaos. And when I'm looking at these pictures of um, Japan uh, with the, the earthquake and the devastation that's there, that's what it was like over in Banda Aceh. On the beaches, uh, there was nothing over eight to 10 inches above ground that was left. All the buildings were just swept off and you went in a, several kilometers inside and the walls of the uh, hospitals were filled about four to five feet high with mud and water upright. You can see the watermark still there. And um, these type of experiences make me realize that we have a mission uh, as believers to go out and to and be salt and light in, during these particular times. But I tell you what, you can't just be thinking initially about what you're going to be doing to help other people if you yourself are not prepared. You will not be in any position to be able to help others if you yourself have not uh, actually uh, prepared yourself. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I actually I have one other thing I want to share about one of my uh, overseas experiences. Last year I went twice to Haiti. Uh, which, uh, how many of you by any chance have gone to Haiti yourself? How many were over there? Okay, there's four or five of you that have actually been there. Um, and uh, the devastation was just absolutely incredible. But the opportunities that we have to be able to show Christ's love in the middle of uh, some of this great devastation is one of the joys that I have as a medical missionary. But right now, the thrust that God's put on my heart is I want to see believers become ready. I want to see churches equipped. I want to see us come together as a community of believers and to be ready ourselves. And, and because of governmental uh, requirements, it's becoming more and more imperative that we become officially certified uh, to be able to provide various types of services uh, if we're involved with various organizations and develop cert teams and that type of thing. This is not my my topic though this morning. I'm really wanting to try to challenge you uh, to be pre uh, prepared uh, yourselves. And so out of, I've gone to various uh, conferences and uh, on disaster preparedness and usually when I've asked people how many of you feel like you're prepared at a personal level to handle three to six months worth of uh, time that you had to really take care of yourself primarily, how many would say y you're ready? 
Now here we are at a disaster conference, and, and it's not everybody here. In fact, it's maybe less than a third, maybe 25% in here are feeling that way. Most conferences where I go to, when it's really not people in leadership, uh, about 5% of people, maybe 10% at the most, actually feel like they're ready. Uh, in my book, I actually had written that I thought they were 10 to 15% ready. I was actually quoting other people that were trying to estimate the number of people that were prepared. As I've gone around and been speaking on this topic, though, I actually find that in my mind the, the real figure is closer to 5%. And so that, that's incredibly disturbing. Um, so my admonition to you is be prepared, don't be a victim. And one of the things that uh, I would say that uh, has really disturbed me as well, when people have not prepared and are always expecting somebody else to rescue them, I think of this picture of a man uh, over in Galveston after um, Hurricane Ike went through there and devastated uh, that area. Uh, this one rescuer that was going to an area that the uh, folks there were advised get out of this area. There's going to be m a major damage here. Your life is on the line. Everybody needs to evacuate. And some people did not. The majority did, but some did not. And this one rescue worker said, you know what, I, don't, I love to come out here and try to help people. But he said, it really irritates me to know that I'm risking my life to try to rescue them when they were warned ahead of time to be ready. And, uh, and, to, and to leave this particular area. And uh, so that's something that I, I really hope that that sinks in. I think of Proverbs chapter 27, 12. It says, a sensible man watches for problems ahead and prepares to meet them. The simpleton never looks and suffers the consequences. So when you see these things coming, and, and as we all see, anybody here who doesn't believe there's major storms ahead? Okay, when you see those storms that are coming, then we need to look ahead and, and, uh, be, and prepare ourselves. And so I really challenge you as leaders, because I think so many of you here are in leadership positions uh, to really lead that way and do what's necessary to prepare yourselves. Um, the next slide. Unfortunately, so many people have the attitude that it's just not going to happen to me. It's always the other person that's going to be affected. Um, in fact, one of the things that I think in some ways actually hindered our, our level of preparedness is Y2K. There was so much hype over Y2K. I've actually had people come up to me in conferences and say, you know what, my uh, basement is still stored with uh, food that uh, uh, I had for the Y2K experience and I got bought generators and spent all these thousands of dollars and nothing ever happened. And uh, they took that as, uh, as a real negative. And so I asked them, well, I tell you what, I said, have you ever had to cash in your life insurance policy? Uh, are you glad that you uh, haven't had to cash in your life ins insurance policy? Are you uh, glad that you haven't had to use the insurance on your home burning down with, with fire? In other words, we do have insurance, not for the purpose that we hope to ever use it. And so even in terms of preparation, it's wise to prepare. Uh, and one of the things that I have um, found uh, People also sometimes turn in a deaf ear because they're saying so many people are crying wolf all the time. They're saying things are going to get bad, all they have this bad news, and they just after a while have dull of hearing. They're dull of hearing because they just don't want to hear it. Uh, next slide. The Center for Research for Epidemi Epidemiology of Disasters has this graph which shows uh, the events of drought, earthquake, extreme temperatures, famine, flood, insect infestation mudslides, volcanic eruptions, uh, tsunamis, that would be the wave and surge, wildfires, windstorm. Look at the incidence of reported uh, disasters uh, starting off in 1900 up through 2000. Now, part of this is recording and reporting. But once you get up to 1960, 1970, our capability of recording these things would have been pretty comparable to what we have today. And look at what's happening. We're just increasing um, incredibly the number of uh, frequency of disasters. And uh, in fact, we're having so many earthquakes around the world that they actually are, have stopped reporting earthquakes at 4.0 or less. There's just too many of them. Uh, otherwise, it'd be in the tens of thousands. They j so they just stop reporting them. So it's got to be greater than a four before they even start reporting some of the earthquakes. Uh, next slide. Um, 
this shows the earthquakes versus climate disasters. Some of the folks there that are trying to talk about this climate change as being responsible for this, that is so bogus. I, uh, but at the same time, we are seeing incredible uh, uh, disasters. And in fact, it, it was in, of interest to me that uh, by, about 30, 40 years ago, they were talking about the coming ice age. Do you remember that? They were worried about the coming ice age. Now all of a sudden, we're into global warming. I, uh, <laughs> it's rather interesting. Next slide. Uh, having a plan will give us peace of mind. Preparation uh, goes a long way. By the way, uh, is there a, um, a clock or some way that I could keep track of time I'm having? Um, I, okay, I, I need to be able to know where I stand. Uh, there was a man uh, in the Twin Towers uh, who actually had been, uh, been there in 1993 on February 26 when they tried to bomb the Twin Towers and several people were killed, a few injured. And he said, you know what, if these guys are trying to uh, blow this building up, I'm going to be prepared. And he actually devised a plan of how he would escape from the Twin Towers should something like that happen again. Well, this gentleman was one of the few people that was in the area above where one of the planes hit and one of the towers that successfully got out because he had made a plan ahead of time. He had already practiced it and it didn't happen until 2001, so it actually didn't have to be put into place for eight years from the time of the first uh, attempt at bombing the, the Twin Towers. But he had a plan ahead of time and having a plan will give you a peace of mind. Trying to prepare in the middle of a disaster if you can't just grab something and go, if you don't instant, instantaneously know how to respond, you're not going to be able to be prepared. But if, when there is no disaster, when there is no problem, you can think clearly, you can get things ready. And what you said, Terry, about what most people were interested in was planning. Well, that's what we need to encourage everybody to do is to plan. Uh, next slide. Um, I received uh, an email last year in May uh, remember when we had all those terrible flooding there uh, going through Nashville? Um, this is a friend of mine uh, who wrote uh, to me this, the following, and the whole area was so terribly flooded, if you remember. He says, Nashville and its surrounding cities are still in recovery of a major disaster caused by 36 hours of continuous rainfall. This was not a 100-year flood, but a 500-year flood. Many people lost their homes and their businesses in the 36 hours of rainfall. The insurance companies would not even give flood insurance because the areas were not in the 100-year flood plain. I believe that there's over a billion dollars worth of damages and the long-range effect will take years to recover. I have read your book and did what I could to be ready. We live high on a hill and did not have uh, water damage, yet we lost power, phone lines, and water. I'm writing to you from my iPhone because I still have no internet access through the phone lines. We had 10 gallons of water and dried food, charcoal, and a grill to eat for the last three days. Those who were moving out of the flood zones were hit with roads washed out and suddenly had nowhere to go. They sat in their vehicles for 30 hours. In fact, he said that they had people stuck on the road below their home that they actually had to go out and help feed them uh, following that flooding. All major roads in and out of Nashville were either completely stopped or extremely limited. When we found a grocery store out of a uh, flood area, they could only take cash or local checks. In fact, that's something we're going to be talking about a little bit later. You do not want to rely on ATMs to get your money. You can imagine in a disaster, if the electricity is down, or even if the electricity is not down, everybody's going to empty those ATMs and nobody's going to be back there to fill them back up again. So you need to have your cash at home. All of these refrigerated foods had to be thrown away. Without water, you have no showers, washing dishes, or toilets. Actually, that's not totally true. Let me just tell you this. One of the things I've learned as a scout was one of the best ways to wash something, go out and get dirt, sand. It'll, it'll take all the grease and a, a goop off and then just rinse it off and it'll be just fine. A dirt works fine. Isn't that something? Um, uh, so without water, you have no showers, washing dishes, or toilets. We just got the shovel and we did the camping method for, uh, for bathrooms. Uh, Dr. Williams, your horses and zebras chapter is very insightful because what can happen will happen. We did a lot of what your book said but did not invest enough in preparation along with practicing these possibilities. Many people did not know where to go or to meet up with their loved ones. The phone service was immediately overwhelmed and communication disappeared quickly. Because see, at that 
uh, in my book, I talk about having prearranged places where to go when you have disasters so you know ahead of time, if you can't communicate, this is where we're going to go as a family and meet. Um, uh, the phone service was immediately overwhelmed. The communications disappeared quickly. At this point, two days after the storms, we cannot bathe and water must be boiled for five minutes if you have power or gas stoves. I could go on, but I want to thank you and encourage you to continue with all due haste your message of preparedness. It's truly our most important job to be ready when all plans fail. And I just really appreciated him writing that. But that was just in Nashville, talking about the kind of disasters that we are facing. In fact, there's been flooding up in New Jersey just uh, being reported recently, and I stop and think of the, the magnitude of the disasters that we've been seeing in the United States are of a level that I'm just not used to hearing over the years. I mean, when I hear in California the wildfires, one million people being displaced by wildfires. I mean, the figures are just unbelievable. Uh, the flooding in the Midwest, uh, hundreds of thousands of people displaced from their homes. Uh, when Katrina hit, 600,000 people being displaced, 1,600 people die. And then this is going on for years. There's still effects of Katrina right now in terms of the negative impact of that particular disaster. <clears throat> so uh, we, do have to, we do have to be ready. And so the question comes, uh, are we ready ourselves? And I'm sure that all of us have, I'd be curious to know, how many of you have jumper cables in your car? I was hoping to see 100%. looks like we have 100%. I just had to jump somebody's car just about two weeks ago at a, re at a restaurant. Uh, keeping flashlights and batteries and umbrellas and so forth in your car are just practical things. And so uh, I'd like to, the next slide, horses or zebras. Um, when I was in medical school, uh, they would teach us how to diagnose various illnesses. And uh, they would say, uh, common things happen commonly. Uh, when you hear hoofbeats behind you, what do you think of? Horses or zebras? Well, here in the United States, we think of horses. Now, when I'm over in Africa, it might be hildebeest, or it might be wildebeest, I mean, or, or zebras, or something like that. But here in the United States, we think of, of horses. Unfortunately, right now, we're having to think about more zebras than what we have in the past. Uh, when we think of terrorism, I consider terrorism as being one of our zebras. But for the majority of, of our preparation, we need to be prepared for our horses, the things that happen most commonly where we live. And um, so I went down through the list of some of the common things that uh, we have to be prepared for. Fires. All of us have to be concerned about home fires as well as uh, wildfires in various areas. Floods, hurricanes, tornadoes. By the way, hurricanes. I live in North Carolina. And uh, normally you would think that you don't have to worry about hurricanes uh, in the western part of North Carolina. Of course, on the east side, they worry about hurricanes all the time coming in uh, from the, uh, on the east coast. But uh, on the west coast, you don't think about that. But we had, after one of the hurricanes, we had eight inches of rainfall on the western part uh, of North Carolina, and that resulted in major flooding uh, that came down uh, where we live. We're at about 1,600 feet above sea level. Our home was not in any jeopardy of being flooded, but when we drove down our driveway and hit the road down below, there was six feet of water in the road. Uh, we couldn't actually pass through the uh, road on one direction. We actually had to go back up over the mountain. And what normally would take five minutes took us 30 minutes to get into town to be able to be able to buy anything because we were otherwise locked in because of that flooding that was from a hurricane. So I didn't have the direct effect of a hurricane. I had the indirect with all the increased flooding. Uh, tornadoes. Uh, how many of you are in, live in areas where tornadoes are a major problem? Those are scary things, aren't they? I tell you what, and you need to have, uh, be prepared for that. Uh, I've lived in areas where there were tornadoes, and a lot of people in the old days, we don't hear this term very much longer, we used to have cellars, uh, where you could uh, just go down in the cellar and be prepared, or, and now we uh, would have basements. Now, when you live in Florida, though, it's hard to have a basement in Florida unless you like swimming, you know, in the basement. But uh, anyway, tornadoes, uh, thunderstorms and lightning. Uh, uh, we're in a high thunderstorm and lightning area where I live, and that was definitely true when I used to live in Florida. Winter storms and ice storms. This is a major thing that we face in North Carolina. In fact, out of the last, uh, we've lived there now uh, for about 11 years, and four times we've had major ice storms uh, that have caused us to lose power for three to four days, and we've had um, to sometimes even transfer our food into somebody else's freezer um, because otherwise we would have lost it. And one time I was overseas, and when we had a major ice storm, my wife had to then go into our neighbor's home 
uh, because it, we didn't have any electricity, and our neighbor actually totally heats <coughs> by wood-burning stove. It just so happens in the last uh, two months, we've installed our own wood-burning stove, and uh, we could uh, actually do fine. If we lost all electricity, we can heat the house adequately uh, and be comfortable and not have to leave our home. So that's one of the things that's been on my mind for several years, and we finally got that accomplished. And so others have to deal with extreme cold and extreme heat. Now, some of you Texans understand about extreme heat. In fact, that uh, brought up um, uh, the, uh, the problem when I was actually down there at the Austin conference there with Daniel. Um, I was talking about storing things in their cars um, and having various food and medications. And uh, they just said, well, what do you do when it gets to be 110 degrees, 115 degrees, and inside your car it's 160 to 170 degrees inside your car? I said, well, you know, I guess in some cases you have to modify what you're going to put in your car because it will be uh, damaged. Uh, uh, but there you'd have to either have it at home or at your place of work and not leave it in the car because uh, that would not, uh, a lot of things would not uh, do well in that kind of heat. Uh, earthquakes. How many of you live in earthquake zone areas. Um, I tell you what, I did not realize that I live in an earthquake zone until I looked it up. In fact, you ought to go back and determine whether or not you live in an earthquake zone. I wasn't even aware where I moved in North Carolina was an earthquake zone. But I did then check what was the strongest earthquake that's ever happened in my area, and the strongest one that's been, it's been a six, but the average are like three and four. So I th said, well, it's still pretty good compared to being on the San Andreas Fault or being on the New Madrid. Uh, but, um, uh, anyway, so earthquakes are something I had to be concerned about. Wildfires, that's always a, a potential danger. Um, and actually, I was down in Texas, and uh, there was a wildfire right near one of the oil refineries. And, uh, the, and I was doing a, uh, talking about disaster preparedness. So they had a wildfire while I was there. And then the night uh, before I was to leave uh, uh, that area of Texas, they had a freezing rain. And uh, I started to get on the, uh, the road to drive back to Dallas to fly out, and there were semi-trailers off the road. Uh, there were a lot of cars that had uh, skidded off the road as well. I said, you know what, I think I'm going to stay right where I'm at one more night. So I went back to the hotel. Fortunately, I didn't slide off getting back to the hotel, stayed one more night, and then left the next day when things cleared out. Uh, but landslides and debris flow, is that something? You have landslides in the areas where you live? I'd be curious to know how many of you actually face that, okay? <clears throat> Some of you have that problem. Volcanoes. Now, that's not too many of us, I imagine, would have that, but I guess if you're living up in the west and you're near um, uh, in Idaho and, and that area in the Yellowstone National Park, uh, how many of you are aware of the fact that Yellowstone National Park is really uh, right on a major volcano? In fact, it's right in the... <laughs> They're, in fact, they're saying that they're having rumblings under there and frequent tremors over there. And they're saying there's certain parts of the park where they can't uh, allow people to go now because the ground is too hot. Um, so um, that's not one of the areas I think I would necessarily want to buy up a permanent uh, residence for uh, in that particular area. And then tsunamis is another thing. And unfortunately, uh, the tsunamis are now in our uh, uh, forefront of our mind because of what's happened in Japan and there are people that are saying that not only is it the uh, San Andreas Fault that is a major concern in the West Coast but the Cascadia Fault which is a little bit further north affecting more of uh, Washington, Oregon and Northern California actually probably has more potential for major uh, damage and with tsunami and they were predicting that if a major quake would occur like happened at the uh, level of the J Japanese earthquake that they would have a tsunami of 100 feet as opposed to the 30 foot wall that went over there in Japan. Have you heard that? Is that something that Okay, a few of you have, but that's the kind of thing that they're predicting uh, could potentially happen there. And then other people are saying the New Madrid Fault is about ready to go off. It's, it's scheduled uh, sort of in terms of the frequency. They're saying it's due for another major quake. And the last time they had the major quake in the early 1800s, the Mississippi River flew in reverse direction. I think Lake Bigfoot was created near Memphis out of that. And that uh, if that should happen again, our government believes enough that it's going to happen uh, and relatively soon that they're actually doing an exercise, a national exercise to do what would happen if the New Madrid Fault went off and they're saying there'd be many lives lost, uh, uh, billions of dollars worth of damage, many people being affected and transportation, uh, gas lines, all sorts of things would be disrupted with a major fault. So 
We need to be ready, is what the things boils down to, and get ready for your horses. If you're ready for your horses, you're more likely to be ready for your zebras. Uh, next slide. Oh, by the way, I had also uh, checked in where I live about hazardous materials, and um, is, uh, is that the time? Okay, okay, Do it great, that's fantastic. Um, it turns out that two major highways that are within just a, uh, maybe less than a half an hour away from my home are routes for tra ta uh, taking hazardous materials. I didn't realize that when I moved to where I'm at. And also nuclear power plants. I thought, well, there's no problem. I'm not near a nuclear power plant. Well, it turns out in South Carolina, just over the border, and I'm not that far away from South Carolina where I live. I'm in the corner of North Carolina and South Carolina are close to each other. And there's a nuclear power plant so that if the winds were just right and there were problems over at that nuclear power plant, I would have to be concerned about a nuclear power plant. The other thing is this. You don't have to just know about the problems of the area where you live. Unless you stay at home all the time and never travel, you need to actually be aware of what you're going to do if you have to travel elsewhere. And you need to alert yourself and become knowledgeable of the types of problems that you will face to the areas where you travel. And so if you go to an area of high earthquakes or high uh, frequency of tornadoes, then you need to know how to be able to respond to those problems, uh, even if that's not the horse where you live, if that's not what you have to prepare for, you need to understand what to do in those, uh, in those cases. Um, next, oh, what, 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 no, let me go back, you were ahead of me on that one. Uh, H2O, what you need to know. Now, it actually, you're gonna be having a breakout session uh, speaking on um, uh, what to do with water and much uh, better, uh, more thorough water preparation and, and a larger quantities. I'm gonna share a few things about things that, at a personal, preparedness level, and I want to demonstrate some of these things. Having safe water is number one requirement in terms of just survival. Uh, remember the tragic pictures that uh, were there of Haiti when they had the earthquake uh, 7.0. Uh, and by the way, you know, the amount of destruction uh, with Haiti was so incredible with a 7.0, whereas in Chile, where they had a 9.0 uh, earthquake earlier, uh, they did have about 1,000 to 2,000 people die in Chile, but nothing like it was in Haiti because of the difference in construction. And, uh, but remember they would show, you know, we've got only a few more days, a few more hours left before we have any hope of uh, rescuing these people because they can't continue to live without water. And so you can live three, four days, five days, six days on some rare, rare occasions. You might live longer than that without water but water is uh, number one on the hit parade in terms of having something uh, safe. And having some type of a f uh, filtration system is very, very important. And I want to demonstrate uh, a couple things that I use. Now, by the way, uh, Terry has available some Katadyne uh, personal use uh, uh, filters that are just absolutely excellent. Uh, there's many different choices that are out there. I actually came across those several that I personally recommend. They're also out there that Terry has available for you. Um, and I want to just demonstrate uh, what, how they can be used. Um, and the reason why I like these is they're so small uh, and they can be put into pockets and uh, you can actually get several for your kids, for instance, and just put them into backpacks and that type of thing and not spend a lot of money for each individual one. But uh, this is a, called the Frontier Filter. It's a carbon micropore torturous path filter. Uh, and it's, um, you have a little straw that uh, goes on the end of it like this. And uh, you can put a container with water and then just suck up through it. And you can say, well, how much uh, will it filter out? It's labeled as having 20 gallon capacity of filtering. But the truth is, as long as you can suck something through this, uh, it's safe water on the other side. Now, this does not take care of sewage contamination. This would be good for like rainwater, uh, pond water, river water, lake water. Um, but if you have a sewage contamination, this is not gonna take care of that. But this will take care of Giardia, Cryptosporidia, and the normal contaminants that you'd have, get rid of bad taste of water, and that type of thing. Uh, it's a small little uh, water filter. This is called the Frontier Pro, and uh, it's a, um, also a, mic a carbon micropore filter torturous path. And you can actually hook this up to a water hose. So if, uh, 
you were able to turn water and the water was contaminated, it could still fi uh, filter through this, uh, but also you can uh, put it onto a two liter bottle. So you have a bottle of some sort of drink and just fill it up and then stick it on here and has a bite valve. You can then just drink with that. But one of the unique things that I um, came across with this particular item, this is a Frontier Pro. It has a, a disposable um, tip available that you can actually put on your water heater. And you can actually stick this on and drain out your water heater. You hook it up here like this, take the bite valve off, and you put a, a plastic tube on the end and you just drain your water heater so that even if you've had to shut off the water to your home because the, the water mains have been broken and uh, you don't have safe water coming into your house, you have 50 to 60 to 100 gallons of good water if you'll do that. Now one thing I would say is if you haven't drained your water heater in a long time, you've got a whole bunch of crud on the bottom, um, you may have to drain out the first part of your water uh, first and collect it into a bucket or something to get rid of some of the major crud, but then you can then put it through um, this filter and it'll get out all the bad taste and it'll make it something to where you'd be willing to drink the water out of your water heater. And the thing I like about this is it has that little rubber top that you can just cover it and protect the, uh, the, the nipple that you would be sucking on if you were drinking the water. So these are also available there that Terry has in the back. Uh, if you're interested. So this is a Frontier Pro and that's the Frontier uh, water filter that I showed you, that smaller one. Um, but having some way to be able to take care of water is going to be the number one thing that you need to do. And since you need to have uh, something in multiple different sites, I mean, some of these water filters can get a little bit pricey. Uh, but the thing I like about these is they're very inexpensive and you can have multiple ones of them and stick them into all your grab-and-go bags, give them into your kids' grab-and-go bags. And if you stop and think about the fact that in terms of your own needs, you need maybe about a half gallon to a gallon of uh, water a day. Now that'll take care of more than just your drinking needs. That'll take care of even some washing and that type of thing. But so that something that'll filter out 20 gallons, uh, that'll last you for even more than a month as an individual. Uh, and so it's, it's very, very practical uh, to be able to use that. Now, one of the things that I had um, always thought, and erroneously, was that I needed to boil water uh, for um, uh, like 10, 15 minutes. Is that kind of what most of you are thinking, boil your water for 10 to 15 minutes? The truth of the matter is, uh, once you get up to 160 some degrees, the, the water is sterile. In fact, when you pasteurize, uh, items, uh, 160 some odd degrees is sufficient to kill all the bugs and viruses and uh, so you don't need to get above that. So if you hit uh, boiling, which is 212 degrees, you've already far surpassed uh, the temperature necessary uh, to kill everything in there if there's any contamination. So if you just bring something up to a boil, uh, you're fine. Um, you, and the nice thing about not having to let it boil for 10 to 15 minutes, when you boil it, you're losing water, your vapor is losing it, and it's also using more fuel. So just bring it up to a boil and then you know that the water is safe. And um, <clears throat> so boiling is really one of the best ways to purify water. But if you happen to have been in some of these devastated areas, you have nothing to cook with. You have nothing to start a fire with. Some of these, uh, you know, you just, you have no means of being able to create fire. And so if um, one of the things that I have done, and I actually bought this, my wife thought I was a little bit off for doing this, but I got a solar cooker, uh, one of these real cheapies. In fact, you can create your own out of cardboard and tinfoil if you really need to do that. Uh, but if you want to spend a little bit of money, you can do that and get something a little bit more sophisticated. But I've actually seen demonstrations of cooking uh, chicken and other things just with the sun. Uh, you can go out and you don't have to worry about things burning up. Uh, but it will, one of these solar cookers will heat water up to about 230 degrees or so. And well, all you have to do is bring it up to a boil. So a solar cooker will cost you nothing. You don't have to have any uh, fuel and, and that type of thing. And having some means of solar heat to heat your water is another way of keeping your water safe. But uh, uh, 
you know, that's, you may not always be able to carry one of those items around with you, and that's again why I like to have as a backup these uh, filters that you can actually use. And uh, they recommend in most of the government uh, books that you need a three-day water supply. Well, if you need um, a half gallon to a gallon of water per person, uh, and you have a family of four, uh, and you need it for three days, uh, you know, you need three gallons for four people, 12 gallons of water. You ever tried to lug 12 gallons of water? I mean, one gallon of water is almost eight pounds. And so it becomes just a, a real difficult thing to try to just carry that amount of water with you. It's only if you're able to stay at home or you had it in your car where you're able to carry that much with you as a practical measure. So that's, again, why you need to have filtration. And uh, there are some really good systems out there. Terry, I believe you have Berkey. Uh, uh, filters out there, water filtration. You're going to be learning more about that. There's a lot of good home systems that you can use and also uh, camping and travel systems that you can use that, uh, that you'll be learning a lot more about that. But make sure that you take care of water. Uh, the next uh, slide. Uh, I saw a book by this title and I captured it for this particular slide. Don't get caught with your pantry down. And uh, this is something to which I understand we've got someone who, is a, who has tremendous expertise in this area that's going to be teaching uh, at this seminar, and I'm looking forward to hearing about this. Uh, those of us that are uh, young enough uh, to remember what our parents uh, used to talk about, how they would can food all the time. How many of you can food out of curiosity? You, right now, you can't. Look at that. Now, that's something. How many of you just started canning within the last five years? Okay, so this is something that all of a sudden... This is becoming more and more popular, but my, my dad used to talk about canning all the time, and my mom, um, but uh, that's a lost art for most people. And I honestly haven't got to that point yet, but I think I do need to learn uh, to do that. And uh, the important thing, of course, with uh, this, if you read the governmental literature, they say have enough food for uh, three to four days uh, and maybe up to two weeks. Uh, my f sense and feeling is that we need to have food a minimum of three months, probably six months, and there's not, it's not unwise to have even a year or more uh, food supply available. Have, the headlines yesterday was food prices have gone up more this past year than uh, in decades. Uh, and uh, if nothing else, uh, it would be very worth your while to have food just to save money. You'd be because the price of food is going to increase. And as we run into situations with the oil crisis, of course, everything is uh, going to go up because the production of food is going to cost more and more if oil prices really go up. In fact, I think one of the most foolish things we've ever done is to allow ethanol uh, to become part of our fuel. We don't need it. And, uh, and the thing is, we're put, taking a huge amount of the production of corn and putting it into our gas tank as opposed to feeding people and we're putting it into feeding some animals and sometimes at a level which is, is not uh, needed the way we do it, uh, particularly uh, when they fatten some of them up and inject them with steroids and produce other bad effects. Uh, there's a lot of things that we're doing to our food supply that is not healthy and is not good. And uh, our policy on ethanol is, I think, a very poor policy as a nation. Uh, so choose foods that do not require refrigeration. Choose foods that do not require special preparation. I know that there's several options there where you can just have boiling water and stick it into uh, the packets, and then you can have your food ready. Those are really excellent options. Um, select foods that require very little water or cooking, and avoid foods that make you thirsty, unless you know that you have long... Uh, 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 have availability of plenty of water um, and decide how much food to store and I appreciated what you had to say Terry that um, plan ahead of time so you aren't storing 6,000 pounds of flour <laughs> and decide how many people you're going to have to prepare for it. <clears throat> now this is one of the things that uh, I would like to just challenge you on and that is um, when you plan don't just plan for yourself and your immediate family uh, if only 5 to 10 percent of people are prepared, there are going to be a lot of people knocking on your door. In fact, one of the things that I would like to challenge you on, and I have this in the workbook, is how to develop your network within your neighborhood. Uh, if you can get your neighbors prepared and you do that collectively, 
uh, that would alleviate a huge amount of pr pressure on you because I'll guarantee you, if you're prepared and none of your neighbors are, you're not going to be able to deny your neighbors assistance and help. But if all your neighbors are prepared, then nobody's going to be immediately wanting to just have to go over and just get food supplies from each other. But this is another challenge I would like to really make to churches. In fact, what would happen if a hundred percent, of course, you know, here you talk about dreaming, uh, 100% of churches actually got ready with food supply and clothing and became uh, designated as centers that could be meeting uh, government requirements for shelter. <clears throat> if everybody got ready, then the need for this 5 to 10% of prepared people being ready to take care of the other 90%, 95%, it wouldn't be there. Everybody would have a greater share of the load of what was needed to be done. And so that's another reason why we need to be prepared as a neighborhood, as a family. And um, one of the challenges that I have, in fact, I'd be curious to know out of, out of your own experience, how many of you had some difficulties getting other family members to really start preparing? Okay, there's the majority of the folks here. Um, I've had people range from where they just don't see the need for it to others will just say in a cavalier way, well, God will just take care of me. You ever had that one? I mean, just, they, my heart really goes out to those that are single parents, totally stretched out, have barely enough time in the day to breathe. Um, that's one of the places where I think the church can step in and do a tremendous job. In fact, one of the things I'm challenging churches to do is identify in your, in your congregation those that are single parents who have to have unique problems with taking care of their children, like if they were at work and their kids were at school or at home or other places. What do you do with the elderly, the handicapped, those with no transportation? You could actually right now plan how to take care of those and have somebody assigned within the church to take care of three or four other people. You could actually have a whole grid worked out to where you have people responsible for others within your congregations when there were certain disasters and that would be a way of alleviating some of this problem. If you try to do that last minute, communications will be down. Uh, you may not be able to uh, notify people of certain things, and, but we'll get into that in just a little bit. Food storage is a very big important thing and one of the uh, things that I think you should learn uh, as a mantra, so to speak, is store what you eat and eat what you store begin a rotational system. And that's one of the things that we've done, my wife, whenever we buy any canned goods or other packaged items, we will write the date of expiration on there. And, uh, but the truth of the matter is, many of these goods are still going to be good far past the expiration date. But as much as possible, we try to rotate these things. And if you need things like milk, for instance, and that, you know, you're in a situation to where you need some things that are in liquid form, uh, having been around the world, I realize a lot of products are made for no refrigeration. Uh, we're just used, so used to refrigeration, but you can get milk that's good for three to four months, six months, that's been pasteurized, and you can actually put that on, the, on your shelves and just rotate that out. So you don't have to just be buying fresh milk that has to be refri refrigerated if for some reason you need to have milk. Um, and uh, so think about some of these things of buying items that don't require refrigeration. Um, and then uh, you're going to have a whole uh, session on how to store food, you know, place in a cool, dry area away from gasoline and other fuels, rotate your emergency food at least every six to 12 months, and label uh, things is going to be a very important thing. Think of alternative cooking uh, sources, uh, candle warmers, fondue pots, charcoal grills. Terry showed you that uh, quick uh, heating up of water, that quick boil uh, item. Uh, charcoal grills, camp stoves, campfire or fireplace cooking, and solar cooking are options. And one thing I would like to make sure that you have in your uh, armamentarian is a can opener, a mechanical can opener. How many of you ever tried to open up a can when you didn't have a can opener? Makes a Christian out of you very quick, doesn't it? I mean, <laughs> I'll tell you, it just can be one of the most frustrating things when you just realize that... Uh, there's good food inside there, and it's something that you're hungry for and you want it, but you have no means to get it out. 
And uh, the number of innovative ways that you try to figure out how to open up that can would be rather amusing if we sat down and talked about it. But have a mechanical can opener. It'll uh, save you uh, a, lot, an awful, a lot of frustration. Uh, but when you stop and think about food, uh, having uh, food both in your grab-and-go bags at home, the car, and also uh, at work. And again, I have that caveat of if you have it in the car, make sure it's not food that's going to be damaged by high heat. Also, think of food for your pets. That's going to be something else that you can easily overlook that. And having some sort of a portable stove or uh, stove fuel would be also helpful. Uh, waterproof proof matches is another thing that I would really recommend that you have. And, um, and then in terms of food, I really like uh, the fact that they have a raised food bed, guard, uh, uh, bed uh, garden. More and more people are coming into home gardening. And I saw the, those pots where you can actually uh, plant food as well. And uh, there's whole books that give you information as to edible ornamentals, uh, things that you can eat that actually become and can beautify your yard, but yet when the push comes to shove, you could actually eat them if you needed to do so. So there's a lot of innovative ways. Uh, next. That's all I'm going to be saying about food, because uh, you're going to be hearing a lot more about that later. But in terms of uh, home readiness, think about money. And uh, cash is king. Uh, one of my cousin's um, uh, daughters was down in the Galveston area and read my book just a few days before Hurricane Ike came through. And one of the recommendations I have in the book is to have at least $500 worth of money at home uh, in small bills. The last thing you want to do is hand somebody a $100 bill for a $5 object or a $2 object, and they ha then have no cash to give you back. So you need to have it in small bills so you can pay for things and not worry about the change, because if uh, you're not going to often be able to get change from whoever you're buying whatever product from. And so have small bills. And I put in my book uh, $500, but the truth of the matter is, as we are getting into more and more serious uh, situations, and now that we're actually talking about the potential for having major banking crisis and major fall uh, in the markets and really great uncertainty, um, my recommendation would be to have enough cash at home for at least one month's expenses. Whatever cash you have to spend, my recommendation, and if you can afford more, great, but then you have to really be concerned about where you're going to put it. Um, <laughs> and don't be like uh, my brother-in-law at one time. I told him to s hide some money. <laughs> he hid it so well he couldn't remember where he put it. And uh, so, uh, you, you know, you need to somehow have more than just yourself know where it is. Uh, and have people that might have to have access to it. Uh, we've actually told some of our children where we are putting some things so that if my wife and I are not home and that, or if, we, if something would happen to us where they would be able to obtain uh, the money. But you need to have more than just yourself know and put it someplace where you're going to be able to remember uh, where, where it is. But I would have it and put it in small bills. Uh, that's going to be very important. Uh, and then... Uh, the story of my cousin's daughter, she ended up putting this money aside and when the hurricane uh, hit over in Galveston, she was 10 days without access to funds. And uh, you know, when the major disasters occur, your ATMs are not going to work, the banks are going to be closed, uh, you're going to have to have uh, funds to live on. So those are very practical issues. Another thing in regards to money, one of the things that um, I recommend, particularly if you have to um, leave your home if you had to evacuate. Uh, I have a money pouch. One of the things I would recommend though is not use those fanny packs that are external uh, where people could either grab them or if you happen to be in a situation to where a tree limb caught on it and pulled it off your waist or whatever. They have money packs that can fit under your waist. Uh, I've actually carried thousands of dollars into countries at times uh, and uh, I just kept it in a pack that actually fits behind the small of my back. You can't even, I mean, even if you feel my back, you would hardly know that it was there. Um, and uh, I would put important things like passport and money and something like that, and then keep smaller amounts in my front pockets uh, or in some other place have easy access to, because the last thing you want to do is fumble around trying to get a, something out of your pouch. But uh, if you need to keep um, information 
uh, end, uh, very vital information, put it inside of one of these pouches. They have them around the waist. Uh, they have those that go around your leg. They have those that come underneath your arm. Uh, but anyway, you get the idea. Having a personal pouch that's not visible it would be important to put these kind of documents. Now, one of the things that I wanted to show you, and this is a little bit out of order, uh, but it's, it has relevance uh, to what we're talking about, and that is having a USB uh, flash drive. Um, this particular thing that I have here is actually a memory care band, which uh, has software on it that uh, will allow you to enter in all your medical information uh, that's pertinent, and it can list your medications, any allergies that you have. And this would be sort of like uh, those bracelets that people have, or dog tags where they have uh, medical alerts, like if they're allergic to something or if they're diabetic. This is a way that people, if they come across somebody unconscious, they'll know what to do and maybe consider that as one of the causes for the person being in the situation where they're at. But these actually are wristbands, or they also have them as keychains is another possible way of doing it. But you can change this information for yourself. It'll actually hold up enough information for 250 people. You could actually use something like this for a whole group of people if you wanted to or everybody in your family. But since it's individual, uh, let's say if you have an elderly person or someone with a really acute illness uh, or handicapped that you might get separated from, if you had something like this on their wrist, uh, then if they were found by medical personnel, this could be taken off, plugged into a computer, and the information that's impertinent to their care would be right on that. But there's also enough space on here that you could uh, scan in documents, important documents that you would want to be able to carry with you. And the nice thing about this is you could stick this into your pouch uh, and have a USB. Now, just any USB will work. Now, you don't have to get a memory care uh, band, but the memory care band is particularly uh, good uh, because of um, uh, the fact that it has the medical information in a nice orderly way that you can go in and change. But that's the advantage of this. But in terms of storing your uh, copying documents. If you already have the memory care band, then you could also use this um, uh, for that purpose as well. But uh, there are some of these that are out there as well if you happen to have any interest uh, in that. But carrying your documents in that form, if you had them stored on a USB flash drive, uh, you could actually put those documents in several different places. You could have it in a grab-and-go bag at home, at work, and on your person. So that's one of the reasons why this next section is uh, home readiness, identity, uh, prevent identity loss and theft. And that's why uh, this slide, it says safely docked, standing for uh, documents. Um, one of the, we always worry about identity theft, uh, but uh, my own family, my wife's mother um, was born in the Ukraine and uh, she was taken prisoner of war by the Germans uh, when she was 17 years old and taken into Germany, and uh, uh, my wife was born in a displaced persons camp over in Germany and came over to the States through Ellis Island when she was like five years old, so I tell people all the time that I've been fond of taking care of refugees, and uh, so uh, I've lived with a refugee for now 40-some years and have, have four kids and seven grandkids, so taking care of refugees is not all bad. And, uh, but uh, the thing that they had to worry about was not identity theft, it was identity loss. They didn't have anything. And I've seen some of these homes over there with the tsunami. Can you believe there's, everything is gonna be gone? I mean, you look at a tsunami effect, or you look at the tornadoes. Have you gone in to look at some of those pictures that everything is literally gone? And uh, so you need to be able to have copies of things in safe places. And I, one of the things I do go through very carefully in the book and workbook is uh, storage of items, uh, where you want to put them. Some of them are going to be uh, in a bank safety deposit box. So the only thing about a, a bank safety deposit box is that if we have a bank holiday or something, you can't have access to your safety deposit box. But one of the things that I did regarding some documents, <clears throat> I was teaching a course at uh, Southeastern University, and um, I emailed myself uh, some of my outlines and some of my PowerPoints and other things. I put it up on Yahoo. Uh, then the next day, my um, computer crashed, and I was relying on my computer for all these documentations. But because I had emailed it to myself and it was on a remote server, all I had to do was 
get up another uh, computer and I downloaded that stuff uh, to myself and I didn't lose a beat and I had all my information. And that's one of the things that you can do. You can uh, email yourself copies or, of whatever it is that you really want to have uh, really safe and not just rely on your backup on a USB drive or a hard drive uh, or an ex external drive. You can actually store it remotely and uh, then uh, no matter where you are, if you've put some of these documents uh, on a remote place and your computer's lost, destroyed, you have no access to it, you can get on somebody else's computer, download the information, and you're good to go. So anyway, that's just a tip uh, if you hadn't thought about something like that. Uh, but the original documents for those things like marriage certificates and birth certificates and all that, you need to be sure that you have in a very safe place um, and store it digitally uh, somewhere as well. Uh, and I go through this, I don't want to take the time now, deeds, titles, titles of vehicles, registration, credit cards, insurance policies. By the way, the best thing to do with credit cards for the most part is tear them up. Now, if, if you can't pay them off monthly, that's one of the things. Get out of debt. That's, that's number one, getting out of debt. I have to use credit cards at times just to even make an airline reservation or to rent cars, but I make sure that I can pay everything off ahead of time. Credit card debt is a real, real problem. Uh, in the United States today, and uh, I'll tell you what, when you finally get outside, get away from debt, uh, the relief is just so absolutely awesome. Um, uh, do documents, your wills, your living wills, your power of attorneys, and so forth need to be uh, very safely kept and safeguarding your business records. One of the things, um, how many of you ever had a major power surge that just wiped out your computer? Okay, there have been several. Obviously, having surge protectors usually will help. Once in a while, the surge can be so great that it'll actually overpower a surge protector. And so having the backups is going to be very, very important. And safeguard your business records. That is going to be very incredible. Uh, next. What a difference a plan makes. You know, there are times, I would be curious to know, how many of you actually live in a place where you've ever been snowed in and couldn't get out for a week or more? Okay. That's another reason to be ready, right? I mean, uh, if you just can't get out, there's nothing that you can do to, to buy. And so you need to have alternative heating uh, wherever possible. And uh, one of the things that we ran into in the last uh, year and a half was the swine flu scare. Remember when they were talking about the possibility of having to quarantine people? And uh, we actually, there were recommendations um, by... Um, uh, Many people, and one of the, I was asked to actually do a paper on preparation for um, uh, what a college campus would do if a swine flu epidemic hit the college campus, and I had to kind of devise a plan for them. Well, one of the things was they had a, this scenario of um, having to quarantine the students. And then the other thing is uh, places like schools would become infirmaries, really. That's where a lot of people would have to go because they have large dormitory space, had a lot of plumbing and other places, uh, it's just the, uh, it was just incredible the, uh, the types of things they were predicting with swine flu. Um, but quarantining is a major issue. Look, look what's happening over in Japan. What are they doing when they have that nuclear disaster within a certain area? They're telling people to do what? Seal up your home and stay in place. Don't go outside. Now what can you do if you happen to have uh, don't have enough food. You know, what if you don't have alternative heating? Look what's happening. They've been without power, but if they had a, a stove, they could have kept themselves warm. Now they have a, a snowstorm over there following that. So these are all different reasons why we need to be ready. Next slide. Well, I'm going to actually skip over the, I'm looking at my time and it's really getting away from me. I put this one up about expecting the unexpected. Uh, the swine flu, that was something to which they were actually, uh, there were so many scares about that. I myself did not take the vaccine. They were really doing quite a bit to push, push that. And let me just say this, I actually have this in the uh, workbook and also a new edition of the book about that. There are several things that will help in terms of fighting infection in general. One of them is get out and get some sun. Did you know that we, vitamin D is a good way to fight infection? And one of the things that we've done in our America, 
uh, is that we have so much sunscreen, we block out one of the beneficial effects of what God put in was just the sun. Secondly, in, in August of a year ago, they actually published in the uh, Journal of Pediatrics that a major portion of our young people today are vitamin D insufficient. And what they ended up recommending blew my mind. They recommended just taking vitamin D supplementation, 400 international units a day. And I'm just saying, listen, if you just stay out in the sun for 10 to 15 minutes a day, you can get several tens of thousands of international units of vitamin D and just get out in the sun. And, and you know, then they're so worried about skin cancer that might occur after decades of exposure to the sun that they say put all this uh, sunblock uh, junk on. And uh, I'm saying, God made the sun for a certain reason and to give us warmth and give us vitamin D and other health things. And that's one of the ways to fight infection. And so another thing, and this is just an important point, elderberry extract. How many of you are aware of elderberry extract? Not too many of you. Uh, that actually has been studied by Israel and also by Norway. Elderberry extract is good when you have the flu. And um, it's a natural way. It actually cuts the incidence and duration of swine flu and other flu in half. And so uh, elderberry extract is something I'd recommend that you have with you uh, and have it at home uh, because it's a natural remedy. And if you can't get out and get other medications or or whatever, uh, it would be a natural way of being able to help yourself. So I would recommend uh, that. Next slide. Uh, when evacuation is necessary, have your route planned out. Now I, I happen to like our GPS systems. I really like GPS. Um, but the problem is I've gone to certain areas where I can't use the GPS. In fact, um, Gary Adams, who uh, works together with me, he and I were traveling here. We used our GPS. and. Um, there were several areas where we went, we had no phone connection. And so during that period of time, we lost the ability to use the GPS. I'm up in the mountains in North Carolina. If I drive in certain areas, I lose the ability to use my GPS. So you don't want to just rely on a GPS. At the same time, if you use the designated evacuation routes that the government has pre-published, that like with hurricanes, if you go down to Florida, they'll say this is a, uh, the evacuation route. How many of you saw the pictures of the traffic jams in Jacksonville uh, when they were trying to get out of the way of a major hurricane? You couldn't drive anywhere. You have to understand some alternative routes uh, in case the major routes that they've designated are all blocked off. Um, now, one thing I did in the book, as opposed to what I did on this PowerPoint, I changed the arrow and had it point upward, evacuation route. I mean, there's some of us that are thinking about uh, one day we have a different evacuation route, but in the meantime, while we're here, let's learn what evacuation routes uh, we need to take. And the other thing is, don't just have it electronically. Uh, have a physical map to where if for some reason you lose the ability to have the electronics, that you can actually physically go to a map and, and, and plot your way out. And have those in your car and also in one of your grab and go bags so that you can physically uh, be able to get out and not just have to depend on electronics like a GPS and so forth. Um, home uh, fires, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, wildfires, mudslides, earthquakes, loss of electrical power, volcanoes, tsunamis, radiation threats, chemical threats, terrorist threats are among the various natural and man-made hazards that may cause you to have to be evacuating from your home. And you may have to uh, evacuate on a moment's notice. Um, this is one of the things that I really um, uh, tell people. If you do have to evacuate, leave in your home uh, where you're going to go, if at all possible. Leave a note there. So if somebody comes into your home, uh, people come to maybe rescue or find out what's going on, you, uh, they will then have means of being, being able to tell loved ones or other people if they're looking for you uh, where you have planned to go. Um, and uh, have prearranged transportation. If you have people that are handicapped uh, or that are elderly or have no transportation, prearrange how you're going to help those people, uh, either of your family, your community, uh, and your neighbors, or of your church. So that's have prearranged transportation. Many elderly people and many handicapped people have a community transportation arranged for them to go to their doctor's visits, to go uh, to uh, shop or whatever. 
those are not going to be available in times of crises. There just aren't going to be enough of them. And so that you as family members need to uh, take that into consideration. The other thing is, I would say, learn to consider whenever your tank of gas gets down to half, consider that as empty. Keep your amount of gas in your car at least half full at all times. Because if you have to leave at a moment's notice, the last thing you're going to want to do is to have to stop and get gas. Consider your half-filled tank as, as being empty. Um, and uh, the other thing is, I would say, designate one vehicle as your evacuation vehicle, if at all possible. Don't try to take every vehicle with you. First of all, you can get separated. Uh, some of you have more than two vehicles even. Uh, some, many of you would have two vehicles, but many of you have even more than that. Don't try to take all your vehicles. If you can, select one vehicle with the best mileage or the best performance or the best safety if you have to go over rough terrain and uh, make sure that that's the one that has the better uh, grab and grow bag for the car. But you need to have it in what, a grab and go bag in all your cars because you don't know where you're going to be. For instance, if something would happen that you couldn't go home, I stop and think of that scripture in the Bible that talks about the time when it's going to be so bad at a certain time when you see such and such happen. It says, don't even go back to your home to grab a bag, just go to the mountains. And there are times when you are not going to be able to go home. And so whatever vehicle you're in, you need to have whatever supplies you need to have. And that's where if you don't happen to have water in it, if you had some sort of water filtration process, so you could go wherever you are and at least get safe water for yourself. Next slide. Uh, from here to there, this is something that I particularly think is very important for uh, children. Uh, uh, some children are latchkey kids, they're, they're at home, uh, and I say that you need to have prearranged where does a child go, uh, often this will be at a teenage level, uh, you're not going to leave real small children by themselves, though unfortunately I'm finding out that that's not always true. I'm finding out that there are kids that are seven, eight, nine years of, old, of age that are by themselves at home because their parents are working. They try to not tell other people, but I, it's unfathomable to me to believe that that's really what's happening, but it's, it's not uncommon in, in this situation. Have pre-planned where the kids would go should there be a problem. You know, if there was a house fire or if there was other uh, potential danger and the child is afraid to be by themselves and needs to leave that area, have a prearranged place for them to go whether it's a neighbor. That's why I'm saying when you hear of these problems, this is where you go. And so that if for some reason there was a problem and your child needed to evacuate and they weren't able to communicate with you, you would know where to look for them. And uh, so that's from here to there. Uh, uh, next, next slide. And have a, a place that would be both near their house and also maybe a more distant place if they had to go further. I have a whole list of uh, checklists of what to do to evacuate your home, but because of time, I'm going to skip over that. I'm going to go to the bare bones essentials. Uh, I have a list here of the bare bones essentials that you need to have in your own personal grab and go bag kit. And the things that I consider to be absolutely necessary is portable water filtration of some sort, water purification tablets or liquids, uh, or the ability to be able to boil the water, uh, have some sort of energy uh, bars or trail mix. Uh, there are some very good energy bars that are out there that uh, will give you 300 calories or more per uh, bar, and uh, they're very small and lightweight. I have some examples in my own bag, um, but also uh, some of these um, uh, uh, trail mixes also are very good, and so you should have those in, in the various areas at home and at uh, work and also in your cars. Having a whistle is going to be very important. Uh, if you happen to injure yourself and you're isolated and it's a way of uh, alerting people where you're at and you could actually then, if you hear somebody out uh, where you're at and, and you hear them close by, having a whistle to alert them uh, to where your location is is important. A first aid kit. A small uh, kit would be all that's necessary, but I personally would recommend make up your own. I have found that the kind that are uh, available in a lot of these uh, uh, shops or just uh, stores are just not adequate. Uh, make up your own. If, if you don't have any other option, go ahead and buy those. I've even gone to the Red Cross and purchased some of theirs, but I even find some of the Red Cross ones 
uh, not being what I would want. Of course, maybe that's because I'm a physician and know some of the things that I want. Uh, but I try to put my own uh, first aid kit together, and I actually have included in uh, my books uh, the types of things I would recommend. Another thing is a smoke hood. Uh, I have that in my bag here. It's a, I have a, a few of them out there that Terry has. But um, uh, think about the fact of if you're in a uh, subway system, if you're in a hotel with a uh, high uh, uh, floor level and you had to go down the stairwell, if it may be filled with smoke, uh, these hoods actually would be very useful to get out. They cover your eyes, nose, and mouth. It has a filter to help you to breathe during that time. Uh, it gives about uh, 25 to 30 minutes of safe air. Uh, most people that die from uh, uh, fires do not die of the actual burns. They die of smoke inhalation. And so that's important to know. Another one is good walking shoes. Uh, make sure that you have good shoes in your bags. Uh, one of the things that was both funny and sad was uh, when the 911 happened, one of the things that uh, women had to do, there were many high heels strewn all over the, uh, the streets because they couldn't walk on their high heels. They couldn't run in them, so they had to get rid of them and then run on their bare feet and risk injuring their feet and cutting their feet and that type of thing. So have good walking shoes. Um, also having some sort of a cord uh, uh, that uh, now this would be useful uh, in terms of either tying some things up or even helping one get down from one uh, story down to another story is another uh, example. Extra money, I've already talked about that. And then uh, having a multi-tool, a Leatherman kit uh, tool type kit, cool, a tool, a uh, multi-tool, something that has like pliers and knives and uh, that type of thing, can openers in them, those a multi-tool would be very, very practical. Um, I have in here a mini pry bar uh, would be also very helpful uh, if you had that in your grab and go bag if you were in an area like earthquake or whatever um, and you had to try to get out there maybe doors that are jammed or uh, you're trying to move things having a small pry bar waterproof matches and also some sort of uh, bandage scissors that's what I actually have listed for my bare bones essential kit and there's so many other things that can be taken I go over that in the book as well so I'm not going to take more time now next slide who are you going to call? Um, this is one that really caught me off guard. My wife and I started going through my workbook, and we realized that we weren't doing what I had said. Uh, you know, I've so relied on my phone to capture all of uh, the phone numbers that I wanted to have. Then I realized, well, the electronics can go down, or the phone's not going to be working, the battery goes down, I have no way to recharge the battery. I needed to have a physical list of uh, who I needed to call and what their numbers were. And so I, I, we wrote that stuff down. I gave our kids and grandkids, and what are those numbers? If you don't have them memorized, don't rely on your phone to always have all that information. The, the police numbers, the fire uh, place numbers, uh, the hospital numbers, those things, you need a physical place in addition to just on your electronic means, whether it's the computer or the phone. Uh, you need to have it in a written form as well uh, with you. And so. Another thing that we, I talk about is uh, a contact information card that you can put and keep on your person, but particularly for children, uh, having a contact information card for children that they carry with them at all times. You can plasticize it and uh, keep it with them, and they can keep it in their pockets or in their uh, backpacks at school or wherever, but some means of being able to uh, identify uh, who should be contacted, particularly with small children, should you get separated from them, and an adult find them and say, well, how do I contact uh, the family members? Uh, and with a major national scenario, this is one which really bothers me, but um, it's one that I think I have to inform people of, and that is, should we ever have a major terrorist act? Let's say, for instance, they keep talking about the potential for a dirty bomb in New York or Chicago, or how many of you have seen that his, History Channel's uh, uh, animation of what would happen if a nuclear weapon went off in Washington, D.C.? Have, have you ever seen that? I saw that on the History Channel. It kind of blew my mind. They were talking about what would happen if, if something like that occurred, and they chose Washington, D.C. as the site. And uh, I think it's wise to have prearranged with your family where you would meet if they had to leave where they're at and meet 
in certain places or how you would communicate with each other if there should be a national catastrophe. It's kind of ominous to even think about that type of thing, but it's something to which uh, if all communication is down, like for instance, they, how many of you have heard about the elect, uh, electro, electronic magnetic pulse that if something should happen, all of a sudden all communication is down. If you have to get together, where are you going to get together? And having that even thought out or planned out would be helpful. Uh, next slide. I, there's so much more I could say about that, but I'm not going to now. We've come into a whole new age. How many of you Twitter out of curiosity? Okay, about four hands have been raised. Um, that's the younger generation that are Twittering. And, uh, but what I put this up for, my son found this uh, slide about uh, tin cans, you know, <laughs> trying to communicate with each other. But there's a whole new means of communication from uh, an electronic media. And you know, some of the Iranian uprising and fighting uh, uh, was, um, and what was going on over there when people were rebelling against their government was um, uh, through Twitter. They actually sent some of the communications through Twitter and Facebook and Skype and that type of thing, this type of communication. Learn to know a little bit of this. In fact, if you don't know it yourself, get your kids to help you out on that. But there's, this is one of the ways of getting certain messages out to one another uh, during uh, uh, um, times of crisis. In fact, I cover in my workbook um, the, uh, uh, the ways uh, that are out there of having like 911 broadcast systems. There's a local church uh, close to us to where the pastor has used a broadcast messaging system to alert the church family for various events for the church, but they could use it for disasters as well. It'll either phone them, email them, fax them, or, fa uh, or you know, send up some sort of communication. It will keep trying until it completes the, that communication with those individuals, and you could do that with your family or with your neighbors. Uh, anyway, I go over that in the book if you happen to be interested in that. And the other thing that I recommend that you have is you have your neighbor's contact information. Uh, I have found this to be very important. Like when we've been out of town and we hear there being some uh, uh, problems like ice storms occurring, uh, difficulties, uh, we've actually arranged with our own neighbors how to get into our house and to be able to shut certain things off or do things there. And um, uh, I just had to do something within the last month and call in a neighbor to find out uh, what was going on because of some bad weather and wanted to inform them uh, or when we're leaving town, I let them know so that they'll be aware of other people that might be around the house. Uh, we need to be alert and taking care of each other. Next slide. Grab and go bags. This, uh, you need to have a grab and go bag at home, work, and uh, in your, each vehicle that you have. Again, try to designate one vehicle that you put more stuff in than the others, if you're, so you'll know that'll be your primary vehicle if you have to leave. Um, and don't get discouraged, just start. You can get overwhelmed if you just start thinking about this, but at the very least, do your minimal grab-and-go bag, bare bones essentials, and uh, how much to pack. Uh, if you pack stuff as a personal grab-and-go bag, make sure you can carry it, because uh, uh, you don't have to just assume it. You can throw it into your car and drive. If you ever had to walk away with the stuff, and as a general rule of thumb, don't pack more than a one-quarter of your body weight. Uh, is a good rule uh, of thumb. And um, where you store your bag is very important. Don't store it in the kitchen, uh, you know, where fires are more likely to occur, that type of thing. Store it in a place close to an exit to your home that you'd probably be leaving from if you can do so, if you had to leave in a, in a major hurry. Um, uh, that's enough for that right now. We have so little time. Next slide. Meds to go. Uh, this is... Um, uh, by the way, I, I, in the grab-and-go bags, make sure you have your first aid kits. I have a, a, a lot of information in my books on that. Medications is a very, very major issue. And I would really uh, advise you to become aware of certain alternative medicines uh, because sometimes our standard medications are not always going to be available. Be aware of the types of things that you can avail yourself of uh, that will be helpful to you. And just like I mentioned to you, elderberry extract is very good uh, and it's not something you're going to have to go to a pharmacy for. But some of you are on life-sustaining uh, medications that are just absolutely important and that you must have them. If that's true, have at least three months' supply of medications. 
uh, because you don't know when you're not going to have access to pharmacies. Can you imagine somebody up in the tsunami uh, over there in Japan? Uh, they've been having people on TV that are saying, I don't have my medicines. My medicines were all uh, washed away. I can't go to the pharmacy. The pharmacies have been all wiped out. But if you had some of these things in grab-and-go bags in your car, in your home, and at workplace, there's different places where you would have some of these some of these items and if you had three months worth of supply that would be very helpful. But the other thing that I would recommend is if you have medications that are absolutely vital to your life and you carry them with you, um, I would have a few days supply on me They're like if, uh, uh, so that you always have something with you. If you did get separated from home uh, get, and you d didn't have access to your normal uh, medications. Get a prescription written by your physician for the medications that you absolutely need. Uh, for certain medications, you have to renew that every six months because some pharmacies won't honor certain meds uh, on a prescription that's older than six months. Others, they'll honor up to a year. But if you have a written prescription, then if you get separated from all your medications and you have to go to another area, you have a prescription that can be filled in the city that you end up ending up going to. And so that's a very practical issue if, you, if medicines are a very Im important issue. A another thing is in your personal grab-and-go bags, you have to put the medications that are responsible for, that you're responsible for or that, are, that you're using personally. There are family grab-and-go bags that I talk about where there are items in there for everybody, but many times in a disaster you get separated from your family. The women go with the children to a certain area, the men go to another area. So make sure that wherever you go, that the medicines that you need go, go with you. And also I would recommend that you having uh, certain non-critical prescription medications at home. Um, if you know that your family as a routine uh, matter needs certain medications fairly often, I would say get those medications at home. Now if it needs a prescription, get it from your physician. Explain to them why you're doing it. Um, and of course non-prescription meds, I would have certain things that are used uh, frequently at home and have, have it on hand. I actually have tried to create for myself, of course I'm a physician and I end up getting medications for about six months in advance and I have, obviously I have access differently than what some of you would have. But uh, I think if you would talk some, some things out with your uh, family doc that they would work with you on this so that you would have these items at home. So, um, and just remember that uh, safe water is a medicine. Make sure that you, because you can get awfully sick from the wrong, uh, wrong water. But another thing, don't forget about pet medicines, okay? Uh, that's a very, very important thing. And keep your medicines safe uh, so that they're not going to be damaged by water or by fire. Next slide. Special needs situations. Uh, I don't know about you, but as we end up having an uh, older generation, I know that my dad, who just passed away a few years ago, um, the last few years uh, of his life, he was living with my sister and he was in a hospital type bed, could barely get up, always required somebody else to help him. But he had oxygen, uh, a commode right beside his bedside. Uh, he had to uh, have all, uh, had canes and walkers. And you know, if you're in an emergency situation where you have to evacuate, my goodness, it's hard to move somebody like that. In fact, my sister actually went through a hurricane in Florida uh, with him there in the home and they ended up hunkering down and just had to stay there in that place. They weren't able to evacuate. It turned out not to be as bad where they were actually at. But if you do have to evacuate, you have to pre-plan that and know how it's going to work out and not rely on your standard mode of, uh, uh, of moving someone. The other thing is keep this in mind. If you can't individually move the person that you're trying to help, you're going to have to prearrange to have somebody else to work with you to get that person into a vehicle. So there's a lot of planning that you need to do in taking care of your family and members with uh, uh, special needs. So elderly, handicapped, uh, evacuation transportation, you need to know what route you're going to take particularly for the handicapped, uh, flood emergencies, uh, and, and by the way don't uh, be concerned about um, uh, making unnecessary evacuations. It'd be better to evacuate and you turn out not having needed to than to end up having to need to and not being able to do it because you waited too long. There, I have a uh, list of recommendations regarding medications, particularly for diabetics and others in the book. I'm going to have to move on. Next slide. Home fires is a very major issue, and I actually have listed in my book uh, all that you need to uh, do in terms of preparing for fires, um, escape routes for fires. In fact, this is one of the things you need to train children 
Make it into a game. Pretend like saying, if you had to get out of this room and I blocked this door off, how would you get out? And just, you know, plan with them. How would they get out of their room and have an alternative access uh, uh, or egress? How they're going to get out of the room? Uh, escape ladders. If you happen to have a situation uh, where you're on a second floor and you can't get out. In fact, the person that helped me uh, with some of the proof texting uh, in my book, uh, as she was helping me, she said, you know what, my bedroom's on the second floor. The only way out of my bedroom is down this wooden staircase. I've got a window out the back of the balcony, but I need a, ex a ladder that I could actually drop down there to climb out of my home should my living room ever catch on fire. She said, I don't have a way out of my home. And so those are things you need to think of. And where you're going to meet if there's uh, a fire, and that's where the here to there analogy comes into place. What you do with your documents, making sure that you have your documents adequately protected. Uh, uh, smoke uh, uh, detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, fire extinguishers, smoke hoods, and that type of thing. Another thing is take a video of your home, of all your goods, because for insurance purposes, you're going to not remember all the things that you had if you ever had a fire. But the, uh, open up your drawers, take videos, and that way you'll be able to have documentation. This is what I own. And I'll tell you what insurance companies want to have you uh, settle up with them right away. Because they know that if, as you have more time to think about it, you're going to realize how much more you've lost. Don't settle just immediately. Let some time settle down to where you have, can think about it logically. But if you have something like a video record, you can actually go through it. It'll remind you what you've had and that way you'll be able to do better. Next slide. Now this pause for pause, okay. Did you know that there's a 911 website for dogs and cats and pets? It's www.pets911.com. <laughs> and uh, you can actually go there. It'll actually tell you what hotels are pet friendly. Uh, you also need to be able to identify where you need to move pets if you can anticipate a certain disaster. How do you handle uh, moving of large animals uh, and how you need to shelter your pets? There's also um, uh, websites that I give in my book uh, talking about if you have stray animals after disasters uh, and you need somebody to take care of them. There's something like it's called Noah's Wish and others where you can call them, email them, and they will help you take care of these stray animals. Um, but anyway, uh, taking care of your pets is going to be very, very important. But the thing I beg of you, I beg of you, don't risk your own life for your pet. Please don't. I, I've seen that happen too often to where people trying to save their pets risk their own lives or other family members. And as much as I love animals, they do not hold the same position before God or before my own life as my family. And don't risk your life. And I've unfortunately seen too many people do that. Next. Remember, prepare for your horses and you'll be ready for your zebras. The next, next slide. I came, I really believe this is the Lord that gave me this. I noticed this, that when 9-11 happened, you dial 911 for emergencies. But for the believer, you dial Psalm 91-1, dwelling under the shadow of the Almighty. And though thousand fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, no plague is going to come now you're dwelling. In other words, they're all 911, but it all depends how you say it. Was it September 11? Was it 911 emergency code? Or was it Psalm 911? And I want to finish with this story, because unfortunately time has run out and have a lot more to say. I'd like to tell you a story of a young couple I know very well who have three children. One wintry storm day, their home lost electrical power. The temperatures were in the low teens. They did not have a generator, but a friend loaned them one to pre, uh, operate as space heaters to keep the family at least somewhat warm and to keep the water pipes from freezing. Little did they know that the generator was not ventilated adequately and carbon monoxide built up inside the home with the greatest accumulation upstairs where the children were sleeping. The day before, the wife had purchased a new smoke detector that also had a carbon monoxide monitor with voice alerting features. In the middle of the night, the alarm went off, carbon monoxide high, carbon monoxide high. The family evacuated and the firemen came and measured the levels of carbon monoxide. It was at lethal levels and would have killed the children in a few hours. This story I know only too well. My wife and I have seven grandchildren. 
and we could have had only four. These were my grandkids. My wife and I daily pray for protection of our children, grandchildren, extended family. We pray Psalm 91. We thank God for his protection. And we believe God caused our daughter-in-law to buy a carbon monoxide monitor one day before. Be prepared. Don't be a victim.